Good morning, everybody. How are you doing out there? How are you doing out there? <laughs> Woo! Excellent, excellent. I was out there on 42nd Street yesterday, and I just want to let you know, you guys looked awesome. What a great privilege for New York to have each and every one of you out there weaving your magic and sharing your talents with the city. We're very proud to have you here. My name is Dan Daly. I'm a retired battalion chief from the New York City Fire Department. And this morning, I'd like to share some experiences with you from New York, from Ground Zero, and from our veterans. Now, you know our city was struck in a terrorist attack, and we lost 343 firefighters here and 3,000 civilians. I was home that morning. A friend called me up. I got the message. I jumped into my car. And on the way down to Ground Zero, I was listening to the radio. And on the radio, there was an announcer at the scene looking at the buildings. And she said, wait, look at the top of the building. It's surrounded by smoke. And then she paused. And she said, oh my god, oh my god, the building is gone. It's hard to describe what I felt in the pit of my heart, knowing that there could be 50,000 people working in those buildings. So on this crystal clear September day, I raced down to the buildings. And I knew this part of the city very well, but it was like landing on another planet. Everything was covered by a thick white dust, and people were running around with a look of shock. But I worked there for six months, and I saw the best of mankind and the worst. I saw the worst of mankind and, and how the heinous criminals destroyed those buildings and, and killed those people. But I saw the best of mankind as volunteers came in from across the country and helped us. Matter of fact, there was a little area at Ground Zero where the volunteers came in and they would set up their tents. And you could go over there and you could get a pair of boots, you could get overalls, you could have a meal. We even had a boat that came in, a cruise boat, serving food. And you know what it was called? The spirit of New York. Wow. And that's just what it was. So I call this little tent city of volunteers my city of angels, because that's what they were. And you had to picture this in your mind now. On this side of me is this huge pile that was ground zero. Hundreds of fires, carnage. And then you would walk across the street to this beautiful area of tents where you could say a prayer with a priest, you could have a cup of coffee. Matter of fact, at one point, we even had chiropractors come in there. And I remember them saying, they set up their table, right, with this white linen. In the middle of this mayhem, in this filthy place, they set up their tables, put the white linen on top. And as we were passing by looking for a cup of coffee, they'd say, hey, firefighter, hey, rescue worker, how about a cup of coffee? Well, I don't think I have to tell you that the macho ethic is alive and well in firefighting and construction. So we were like, <clears throat> uh, no thank you, I'm just going to have a cup of black coffee and head back up on the pile, right? Well, fast forward about three weeks after everybody was bent over digging in those little holes. Now you had to wait online to get a little massage or an adjustment. And you had some of your biggest, burliest guys waiting online. So it really became a very special place. Now, I had been a school teacher before I joined the fire department. And incidentally, I found it a lot less stressful running into a burning building than an eight-period guidance class in the South Bronx. That happens to be true. So anyhow, I, st I knew that the children of our generation were taking a hit with what happened at Ground Zero. So I started speaking at schools. And eventually, I traveled with the State Department to 150 cities from Nicaragua to Nepal and Canada to Chile. And there was a, a, something that happened to me that I'll never forget and still inspires me today. I was speaking at a grammar school in Los Gatos, California, and the kids lined up for an autograph after I spoke. Now, I'm a little kid from the Bronx, so anytime you want an autograph, you got it, right? So I'm signing the autographs, and I noticed that the last girl online was this beautiful little girl, about six or seven years old, and she even had the word cute embroidered on her dress. And as she walked up to me, I saw she didn't have a pencil 
or a pad in her hand. So I'm kind of curious what this young gal was going to do or say. So finally, this precious young girl walks up to me, looks up at me and said, I just want to give you a big hug. And then she wrapped her tiny arms around me. Wow, what a powerful moment. The next day I was flying off to Chile to begin my presentations. And as I sat there alone on the plane looking out the window, I couldn't get that little girl out of my mind. I couldn't help but feel that she was a little bit afraid of the world that we were handing to her. So all of us, no matter how old, how young we are, whatever persuasion, wherever we come from in this great country, we owe it to that little girl in Los Gatos, to the children of America, and to the children of all nations, a world that's safe. And no one has contributed more to this than our military. We owe them a great debt of gratitude. For the last six years, I've been volunteering my time with the soldiers who have come home missing arms and legs. And I'll tell you, they are quite an inspiration. One time, I was down in Walter Reed Hospital helping out, and I stepped outside the building for a second to get a breath of fresh air. And there was an older fellow next to me, and I asked him if he knew anybody in the hospital. And he said, yes, my son is in here. And I said, is he OK? And then he told me a story that still sends chills up my spine. He said, my son is going to be OK. He was hit with an explosive device in Iraq. He lost both his legs and one arm. And he was in a coma for two months. When he finally awoke, his father was by his side. And his father had to break the news to him that he was missing his limbs. And when his father told him, the first words of his son was, how, how did my buddy Joe make out? And the father told him, Joe made out pretty good. And this young man in bed, Kevin, said, thank God it was me and not Joe that was struck, because Joe has a wife and a new baby. Can you imagine that? What kind of courage and character this young man had to just find out that he lost three limbs and to come up with those beautiful words of compassion for his buddy. You know, we go down to Walter Reed Hospital and we bring, we find these troops who are severely injured and we encourage them to get out of the hospital bed and to continue to do things to lead your life. Because a lot of them are only a few years older than you, 19, 20 years old. And we bring them up to New York and we give them hand cycles so if they don't have any legs, they can cycle to 26.2 miles of the marathon with their hands. So one of the fellows, we just brought 50 of them up this last weekend, and one of them was a Navy SEAL. Now, if you know about Navy SEALs, they're very, very qualified individuals. And he had both his legs blown off from the hip. But he did half of the marathon on his hand cycle, and then he got up with his brand new prosthetic devices, because he was just uh, injured eight months ago. His brand new legs, and he finished the marathon. Can you imagine that? Where does this kind of courage come from?